Well, I want to begin today by doing something a little unusual. I want to give a greeting uh, to someone who was part of our Chapel Street family for a number of years, then heard the call of God on her life, and now lives and serves far away from here. Uh, this past summer, I had a chance to travel to Africa, and one of the places I stopped was Kigali, Rwanda, to visit Amanda Good, who's serving with uh, uh, Hope for Life there. You remember we raised money for Amanda back at Christmas time. But the lady who I'm talking about lives and serves in a Rafiki village just about an hour uh, outside of Kigali, Rwanda. Her name is Martha Newton. Martha, I, she watches our Chapel Street, South Street sermons every week, she said, when they're online. And I promised her I would give her a greeting the first time I preached at, Ch at South Street when I was back. So Martha, we want to say hi to you today. I know you're watching. I don't know what day it is in Africa, but I know you're watching. So we hope you're encouraged uh, by that we remember you and we'll remember to pray for you. And we hope your ministry there at the school is going well. So thank you for being with us today. And also, um, Kenton did mention our annual meeting, and that's happening today at, at Mill Creek uh, at about 12.15. One of the things you'll hear about there, we don't just talk about budgets, we talk about ministries, and our Shepherd's Heart ministry that's located right down, down at, this, at the lower level of this campus, that Shepherd's Heart ministry touched over 10,000 people in the last year, came through the doors for Shepherd's Heart. That's why we need more people serving in that ministry right here from this campus. So if you have time and your heart's pulled that way, join us uh, in serving in Shepherd's Heart. Okay, so how many of you keep scrapbooks? Anybody do a scrapbook here? How about photo albums? Photo albums, scrapbooks, anybody? A lot of us do that. Well, I did a little research and found out that the word scrapbook appeared in the English Dictionary for the first time in 1821. But the idea of collecting memories and um, stories started way back earlier than that, somewhere in the Middle Ages, uh, coinciding roughly with the invention of the printing press and books as we know them today. In fact, the earliest scrapbooks of sorts were family Bibles. People would use their family Bibles to record family histories, uh, marriages, children's birthdays, and they would also put other mem uh, little mementos into their family Bibles and save them and pass them on to next generations. Some of you may have family Bibles like that in your possession even today. Well, today, scrapbooking is considered one of the most popular crafts or hobbies in America. At its peak a few years ago, scrapbooking was a $2.5 billion industry in America, with 1,600 companies making scrapbooking products. Now, there's been a slight decline in the last 10 years or so as more and more people uh, go to technology and store their, their images and, and pictures on computers and so forth. My wife and I do store a lot of our pictures now on computers, but we also like traditional scrapbooking. So I brought some of our scrapbooks of our boys here today. You're welcome to like pour through them. <laughs> but I counted, and this is a small portion. I counted, we have over 30 of these at our house, in our basement, in my office, all over the place. And uh, that pretty much just means that we're old because, you know, you have lots of memories the older you get. But we're, they're precious to us. Our scrapbooks help us to remember. Speaking of memory, uh, did you know that scientists now believe that human memory begins in the womb? That just 20 weeks after conception, an em a, a baby's brain is capable of remembering. I have no idea how they know that. And I'm pretty glad I don't remember uh, those days. But that's what they claim. Scientists also believe that the capacity of our brains to remember stuff is virtually limitless. The capacity of the human brain to remember is virtually limitless. I thought to myself, if that's true, why do I forget to pick up milk on the way home? <laughs> right? Well, that has to do with uh, how things go from short-term memory to long-term memory. Short-term memory lasts about 20 to 30 seconds, which is very discouraging for a preacher, <laughs> if you think about it. However, long-term memory can last for a lifetime, which is very encouraging for a preacher. Now, uh, the process of getting something from short-term to long-term memory is very, very complicated, but basically has to do with retrieving and rehearsing the memory, and then connecting that memory to some sort of different stimulus, visual or auditory or even smell, which is why hearing a song on the radio can take you back to a certain time or memory in your life, or why the smell of fresh, fresh baked bread can immediately spur a memory. It's how our memories work. It's how they're designed. 
So my stack of scrapbooks helps me to remember the events and people of, in my life. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Not scrapbooking, but remembering. We're in a series called The Disciplines of Grace, as you know. And week by week, all summer long, we've been talking about building healthy spiritual habits into our lives. Things like gratitude and generosity and listening. Last week we talked about seeking, and today we're going to look at the discipline of remembering. Now that may sound a little odd as a spiritual discipline, but actually remembering plays a huge role in the story of the Bible. For example, in the book of Exodus we read about the great story of the, the delivery of the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. And you know that God uh, delivered his people, that they, they left, they crossed the sea on dry ground, they wandered around in the desert for 40 years, and then they come to the very edge of the promised land. And the story shifts to the book of Joshua, and we find out that between the people and the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, what God has promised them, a place to dwell with them, there stands the river, the Jordan River. And the Bible tells us that at, the, at that moment, the Jordan River was at flood stage. It was harvest season. It had overflowed its banks. A lot of scholars think it was up to like a half a mile wide. And God tells them to do this unusual thing, tells them to take the Ark of the Covenant, which was the holiest thing they possessed, and to carry it and go stand in the river. Now, we read that and hear the story, and it's like a Bible story, right? Uh, oh, so people went and stood in the river. We don't really listen to the story. But think about it. These were desert-dwelling, nomadic people. None of them had swim lessons at the YMCA as kids. And God tells them to take the holiest thing they have, the most valuable object they have, and go stand in the water at flood stage. It's really kind of funny. And they do. And when they go into the water, God causes the waters to dry up, in a heap, to stand up in a heap, and they walk through on dry ground. It's a marvelous, miraculous story. And then after that story, he tells them to do something just as surprising. That's where we pick up the story today. I'm going to read for, to you from Joshua chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. And then verse 24, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. So they cross the river, they finally enter the promised land, and the first thing God tells them to do is go back to the middle of the Jordan and pick up 12 large stones and bring them out and set them up in a heap. Why? Well, to help them remember. God wants them to remember three things. This is what we're gonna talk about today. He wants them to remember who he is, what he's done, and who they are. First, we are to remember who God is. I grew up as a boy believing that my father was the strongest man in the world. Maybe a lot of you grew up that way, but my father really was the strongest man in the world. Now, my dad was an average size guy. Uh, he's actually shrunk over the years, but he was about 5'10", maybe 185 pounds. Just an ordinary size guy, but to my brother and me, he was the strongest man in the world. That's because when we wrestled with him at night in the family room, we could feel his weight and his strength. Because when we threw the football in the yard, he could throw it all the way to the end of the yard. So to us, he could do anything. One night, uh, we were, he, he put us to bed in our bunk beds in our room. We were maybe 10 and 8 years old, maybe a little younger than that. And after he said goodnight to us, he was walking out of our room turned off the light to our room, but the hallway light was still on. And he turned around just for a moment, and in that moment, he was silhouetted with the hall light on behind him. And he, I still remember, it was a long time ago, he was wearing his suit pants from the day in the office, but he had taken off his dresser, so he just had a, his T-shirt on, just a white T-shirt. 
And in that moment, as I looked at him, as a silhouetted, it was as if his, he filled the entire door frame. He turned around just briefly and said, night guys. He walked out and he turned off that light. And my brother and I were in our bunk beds, he on the top, me on the lower level, and we were in silent, stunned silence for a few seconds. And then my younger brother, in a really soft voice, said to me, did you see that? I said, yeah, he's huge. <laughs> now, looking back, I understand that our father was huge to us, not because of his physical size or his strength, but because of the place he had in our lives. His presence, his love, his protection made him huge to us. Joshua says, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? And by the way, another encouragement about our parenting summit, this is why we're doing it, because whether your kids are five years old or 25 years old or 45 years old, sooner or later they're going to ask you, what does this mean? What do these stones mean? Where is God? Who is God? What do I do with my life? And we want parents to be prepared to answer that question, just like in this ancient story. So when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. So the 12 stones were to help them remember that God is huge. He says that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. Now the Bible often uses that phrase, the hand of the Lord or the arm of the Lord, to describe the power, the unique power and authority of God Almighty. In creation, for example, in the book of Isaiah, God says of himself, my own hand laid the foundations of the earth. My right hand spread out the heavens to bring judgment against evil. In 1 Samuel we read that the hand of the Lord is heavy against his enemies. The hand of the Lord is to protect and deliver. So the stones would remind the people that it was by God's power that they were delivered from the Egyptians. It was by God's power that they walked across the sea on dry ground. By God's power, he provided food in the wilderness. By God's power, he went ahead of them. By the pillar of fire by night and the cloud of smoke by day. By his power, they had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. The stones would remind them who God is. He is powerful. The second thing is that they were to remember that God, because of his power and his authority and his sovereignty, is to be worshipped. He says, so that you may always fear the Lord your God. Now, that phrase, fear of the Lord, means to stand in awe of, to approach God with great reverence. I don't know if you saw the little story this past week. Not little story, but one of the news stories was about the six police officers shot in Philadelphia. They all survived which is good, uh, and in the press conference afterward, I, one of the police officials was giving his report, and what he said was, quote, somebody upstairs was watching over these cops today. I smiled at the phrase, somebody upstairs. And now I know what he meant, kind of, you know. It's how people talk in the public forum. Somebody upstairs, you know, the big guy. But whenever I hear someone refer to God like that, I wonder, are they talking about the same God I'm talking about? Do they know who it is they're speaking of? A writer named Annie Dillard has written, does anyone have the foggiest idea what sort of power we so blithely invoke? It's madness to wear straw hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews. Question, why would they need to build a pile of memory stones to remember who God is? I mean, this is God we're talking about, maker of heaven and earth, almighty in power, infinite in his knowledge. How could they possibly forget who God is? You remember the story. The Hebrew people are slaves in Egypt for like 400 years. So God sends Moses, let my people go, sends the 10 plagues, including the angel of death, where we get this Passover story from. He parts the sea. This is the exodus, the miraculous deliverance of God's people. And within a month, if you look at the timeline, within a month they start complaining to Moses. Why'd you bring us out here in the desert to die? We'd be better off back in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. We shake our heads. How could you forget? But the truth is, we can do that too, can't we? How do we forget? 
Well, I have to admit, sometimes I forget who God is when I'm, when I'm uncomfortable. I mentioned um, making the trip to Africa this summer. Just an incredible experience. I'll share more of it as we go on through the fall, probably. But while there, you know, I visited with people and saw churches made out of literally mud and sticks. Just people, human beings, scratching out an existence. I get home, and my, my air conditioner in my car isn't working properly. And I'm like, where are you? How could you abandon me like this, right? <laughs> or maybe it's a little more serious issue for you. Maybe there's an illness. Maybe there's a loss or some sort of pain. And we, we wonder where God is. We forget his power. We forget his authority. But the really ironic thing is I can equally forget who he is when I'm comfortable. When I'm sitting on a porch on a beautiful late afternoon and the grass is green, It's not right now, but when the grass is green and the kids are healthy and the wife is happy and there's money in the bank and I can think to myself, instead of a a prayer of thanksgiving and gratitude, I can think to myself, yeah, no, did pretty well for myself here. Sort of take credit. God actually warns us about this in Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, be careful, you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's how we forget. I think he says the same thing to us today. You, you in the Fox Valley who have built fine houses, you who have more than you need to eat, more than enough, remember, don't forget who he is. Remember who God is. Secondly, in this story, we are to remember what God has done. What God has done. Uh, Many of you here will remember the process uh, we went through as a church family 20 years ago uh, when we outgrew Uh, this campus and we found land out there where our Kesslinger campus is now. We bought that land in about 1999, 2000. We didn't build the first phase of that that campus until 2004. We didn't finish the steeple tower until fall of 2005. At some point after we finished that tower, um, the man whose company contracted to build the tower attended our church and his name was Dick Porter. And he showed up at my office with a surprise. He brought me this brick, which is one of the bricks that campus is built out of and the tower is built out of and he had a little plaque put on it that says Pastor Coffee steeple completion October 2005 and he just gave it to me as a remembrance and I kept it in my office all those years since as a reminder of what God has done and as a reminder of what God can do through his church through his people that's what we're seeing here in the story it says, in the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So the stones would remind them of God's deliverance, his salvation. Here's a question. How often do you remember when and how God saved you? When Jesus first touched your heart with his grace and forgiveness. If you're married, for example, does your husband or wife know your story? If you're a parent, do your children know your story, your faith story? If you're a student, do your friends know your story? Do your teammates know your story? Do they know how God saved you? Here's how Peter talks about what God has done. 2 Peter chapter 1. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. That's salvation. Through these, he's given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Then in verse 12, so I will always remind you of these things. Notice the words I put in red. Even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know that I will soon be put aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. What's he talking about? 
I think Paul wants his readers to remember two, excuse me, Peter wants his, listener, his readers to remember two main truths. First, God's provision in Christ. He wants them to remember God's provision, that God provides new hearts and new hope through the forgiveness of sin, which Jesus purchased for us on the cross. That's the core of the gospel. And interestingly, when we remember the cross, we can forget our sin. Did you know the Bible says that? That's why Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We can forget because God has forgotten. In Isaiah 43, God himself says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. You know, sometimes we get this backwards. Sometimes we spend lots of energy remembering our failures and our sins and we, we wallow in that shame and we forget the promise of his grace, the power of his grace. God wants us to do it the other way around. He says, remember what I've done for you. And forget all that stuff. By the way, this is what communion and baptism are about. Two tangible symbols Jesus gave us to remember what God has done. Secondly, he wants us to remember the promises we have in Christ. He says, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises. What are those promises? Well, one is new destiny, the great promise of eternal life, uh, that we will live and reign and rule with Jesus forever in the new heaven and the new earth. You know, we talk about that at Christian funerals. We talk about it at graveside services. But it's a promise we can hold on to every single day of our lives. And then there's a promise of new identity. That as we are adopted as sons and daughters of God, co-heirs with Christ, that is our inheritance is his inheritance. His inheritance is our inheritance. Which leads me to the third thing I want to talk about today, and that is we are to remember who we are. Remember who God is, remember what God has done, and then remember who we are. So the 12 stones are like, a, like an ancient version of a scrapbook as a reminder of who God is, what he's done, and who we are. Again, Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. As you come to him, the living stone, that's Jesus, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9. But you are, listen to all the words that are about identity. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. This is all about who we are. It's all about identity. You know, there's a lot of talk about identity today in our culture. It's one of the main topics of conversation. One of the main topics on social media and so forth. Identity is just what you think of yourself. It's just who you think you are. I've said this often, but one of the things my own parents did very well when I was growing up is they reminded me consistently who I was, who I am. Not just as their son, not just as the oldest of three brothers, but they reminded me that I belonged to God. I, I often say this, I didn't live a single day of my life. This is kind of what our parenting summit will be about. I didn't live a single day of my life when I didn't know Jesus knew me, he loved me, and had a plan to use my life for his purpose. Not a single day. My parents gave me a sense of identity, anchored it in who God is and what he's done. God tells Joshua to set up the 12 stones so that when their children ask, what do those stones mean? They could remind them of the great story and remind them of who they were. So here's what Peter says about who we are. He says, you are living stones being built into a spiritual house. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. He's talking about what we are here today. He's talking about the church. 
that God, through Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, has formed a new kind of community in the world. People bound together not by social class, not by nationality, not by language, not by race, but a people bound together by the power of the gospel to be the body of Christ in the world. And then he says, you are God's special possession. I wonder if you heard that when I read it the first time. You are his special possession. That means you and me who often forget who he is. It means you and me who sometimes live as if we don't even know him. It means you who sometimes feel like your past failures and sins have disqualified you from his grace and his promise. It means even you. You are his special possession possession. One of our family's favorite movies is The Lion King. Anybody know when that movie first came out, the animated version? 1994. 1994. This summer, a new version came out. Have you seen it? New, the new sort of digitized version where, they, where the animals look like real animals. We saw that a couple weeks ago, but it's the same story. Tells the story of Mufasa, the great king of Pride Rock, and his young son Simba, who is the future king. And Mufasa is, is grooming his son to one day take his place as king. But Mufasa is killed in a wildebeest stampede that's instigated by his jealous brother Scar. And if that's a spoiler for you, sorry, it's been out 25 years. You should have seen it by now. <laughs> Scar convinces young Simba that it was all his fault, so Simba runs away. He runs away from his destiny. He runs away from his, his homeland in shame and fear, and he hides. And sometime later, Simba has a vision of his father, Mufasa, who speaks to him from the sky. And Mufasa says to Simba, and I love this line because it's biblical. He says, Simba, remember who you are. You were born for something better than this. You were destined for something better than this. Remember who you are. And through this story, what God is saying to us through his word is the same thing. He's saying, remember. Remember who I am. Remember what I've done. Remember who you are. You were destined for something better than this. Every week we've been giving you things to think about or, or, or little spiritual challenges to build into your your spiritual habits, and uh, this week it's more like a little project. What I want you to think about is creating for yourself a sort of spiritual memory stone. That is, a tangible reminder of what God has done in your story. The past month, maybe. Maybe the past year. Maybe in your life. But it might, be a, it might be a stone, a literal stone. It might be a brick. It might be a flower. It might be a photograph. It might be a, a painting. It might be a jar of peanut butter. I don't know. But something that represents to you what God has done. And then when you find that thing and have it, set it somewhere sort of in public where people can see it. Put it on your kitchen table. Put it on your desk at work. If you're a student, put it in your locker if it fits. And when someone sees it and says, hey, what, what's, what's with the, what's, what is that? Tell the story. Tell the story of what God has done. Tell them who he's made you in Christ. Just share the story. Remember. You bow with me as I close. Lord, we thank you for this reminder today to remember. So often we remember the things that are sort of least important and we forget the things that are most important. Help us to remember who you are. Help us to remember what you have done, where we've seen your hand at work. And help us to remember who we are, and that by your grace, we belong to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.